if you smack the water, you send energy this way, right, onto the blades, and then, of course, energy comes back. Because the moment the blade finds resistance, boom, then the energy travels back into the body. And this is usually when weak point number two, right here, is overwhelmed. Ladies and gents, hello and a very warm welcome. My name is Aram, and this is the Competitive Rowing Channel. This video is about one of the best lightweight rowers Great Britain has ever had, Zach Purchase. He's not active anymore, former Olympic medalist, and this is one of the most sought after training videos on YouTube, rightfully so. In this video, I'm going to review it. I'm going to review it in two stages. Stage one, for beginners and intermediate athletes, as this is everything you want to strive for in your first couple months of rowing. And then I'm going to review it from the point of view of an advanced and professional athlete who wants to get the last bit of speed. Because here, not everything is perfect. Let's go. Check it out. Stage one, from a beginner and intermediate athlete's point of view. What Zach Purchase is doing absolutely right and better than most other athletes is that he's using his entire trunk as one lever. And by that, I mean the section from his armpit down to his hip joint. Why is this important? If you look at the trunk, it is essentially deprived of bones. So from hands to elbows and elbows to shoulders, it's pretty much a nicely fully integrated bone structure we can use to transfer energy. From our, from our ankles, feet, ankles up to our knee, fully integrated bone structure. Knee, hip joint, fully integrated bone structure. But hip joint, shoulder, there's not much that would help us. We're deprived of a proper skeleton. So what do we have? We've got the spine. Hey, if you've ever seen a skeleton, even these ones made out of plastic, they have to hang them up. The spine itself is not a solid structure that will allow us to keep the back straight. Well, in the front, we have the chest bone. The chest bone is, is, is a half solution. As we say in German, it's going down only half the way. I mean, this is for a good reason, but it's going down half the way. So we don't have, on the ventral side, we don't have a structural integrity of the bones as well. And then the rib cage, come on. Some people even break their ribs when they sneeze. So this is nothing to rely on. But then we've got all the sensitive organs in there lungs and liver and on the kidneys and all that stuff so the only thing that allows us to transfer force through these parts here from hip joints the vulnerable point to shoulders is muscles and muscles are tricky we don't just need strength we need the coordination we also need a mobility and full range of motion strength which means you need to be able to rotate the pelvis, for example. You need to know how to engage muscles that allow you to have structural integrity. Because there are two kinds of muscles. The ones you can willing, willingly contract and the ones you cannot willingly contract. And the ones we need for stability in the trunk are very difficult to contract willingly. I'm mostly talking about the inner stabilizers. For example, the transverse abdomini. Transverse abdominis is very difficult to trigger. So we use, we coaches use metaphors to make sure you trigger these muscles the right way. So this is why a lot of people have a hard time at the beginning, especially if they learn in a linear erg and not in a true rowing environment. In a true rowing environment, back injuries are usually not a big deal. And back injuries, again, have to be specified because a lot of people simply have strained muscles because they're overwhelmed because, hey, there's a lot of force going from your knees into your hip joint because your legs are so strong. But then you've got that weak spot here. And a lot of athletes have a pretty round back. So we've got the, the, the erectors here in the back, the small muscles around the spine, which are now completely overwhelmed with the massive leg force that is provided at the catch. Even, even advanced and intermediate rowers are being coached that you have to kick hard with your legs at the catch, but that's just going to brutalize your back even more. So what Zach Purchase does extremely well, he's got his back under control. And that is one of the most important things you can look for when you're a beginner rower or an intermediate rower. Getting your entire back under control, using it as one fully integrated part of leverage is the best thing you can do. And there are a couple of tricks. One of the tricks, for example, is to try to pull your trunk up, so to lengthen the trunk. In today's Saturday session, 
we did something where we said, okay, you want to try to lengthen your trunk from the low waistline up just below the chest. And that allows you to have a better structural integrity. If you want to join, it's a couple bucks a month and you join the Saturday sessions live. And this is how it works. You put a phone on the side and use a Bluetooth headset or any kind of headset so you can hear me. And then I coach you live for 45 minutes in a small group session. You can also do this on the water. So I've got athletes to join from the water. So they use an old backstay, an old phone, use a main phone as Wi-Fi hotspot, and then use Zoom. And I see you just as if we were in a launch right next to you. It's pretty cool to coach like that. And if you don't want to participate live, there's an option to simply join and re-watch all the sessions. So there's a full archive. You can watch and redo the sessions whenever you have time to do that. And if you want to go for the bigger option, you can choose a training plan package and the Saturday lives and one-on-one -on -one sessions. Now back to the topic. The structural integrity of SEC Purchases trunk is exactly what you need. This, it starts with a nice pelvic rotation and goes all the way up to being able to contract the upper sections of your trunk. This is pretty much an ideal solution. The next excellent point is that SEC Purchases is able to activate the lat. You see this muscle right there? There are two kinds of muscles we need at that stage. We need the latissimus dorsi, which goes down all the way into your back. And it becomes pretty wide. It goes all the way into your back. Sorry, my drawing is really not beautiful. And then we need the teres major, which is essentially a tiny strip right there, which is responsible for horizontal connection. So what should you do? Should you keep your shoulders long and loose? Or should you have them tight? Now, there are two kinds of looseness. The first kind of looseness is where you're so loose that your shoulders go up and go high, and that's going to make the upper section of your trunk too round right there. And with Zach, that's not the case. In this video, he holds it quite nicely. However, quick of a sneak peek for stage two of that review, this is going to be one of the points I think where he's losing speed. Even one of the technically most advanced athletes in the world at that time lost speed there. That's my humble opinion. But what Zach's doing really well, he's able to keep his shoulders low. That's important. For you, beginners and intermediate athletes, even pro athletes, it's a big deal. Try to keep the shoulders as low as you can. Keep the trunk as stable as you can. Make sure there's a solid, solid connection from here going all the way up. And then if your shoulders are low, you can keep them long. And that looseness starts right here around the shoulder blades. Does it make sense? So instead of being super loose and having shoulders high, you want to use the latissimus dorsi because it's meant to do that to pull the shoulders down. And then you can have your shoulders fairly loose because the lat, the lats on both sides will protect your shoulders because the shoulders are not connected through bones as well. It's only muscles and tendons. So you have to make sure your muscles hold your shoulders in place vertically. That's the trick. And a bit with the teres major horizontally. And that's what Zach does better than most other athletes. Almost perfect. Almost. Not quite. Let's look at his rowing a bit. So the body positioning is one major factor. The, the interesting part is here at the, at the catch. He's able to hold that. So the position I was just referring to here between going to the catch and connecting the blades in the water and then holding your hands stable, that is about as good as it gets. Here at the, at the beginning of the drive, you want to make sure that this, this section here pretty much stays the way it is and this section here as well. That's the difficult part. These are the two weak points. So in every in, in every catch environment, and that's also valid for you advanced and pro rowers. Here, this is weak point number two, because it's usually not such a big deal. And this is certainly the prime weak point, weak point number one. This is if, if you become loose in your low back because you lose the idea of how to pull up the trunk, uh, how to pull up the trunk, or you lose the idea of how to sit tall and at the same time pull the shoulders low into the trunk, that will make your hands go up. And if your hands go up, your blades go deep. And if your blades go deep, then your shoulders will become 
will go high as well. So in this video, it looks good. That's UT2. That's a mid to low intensity that you should be able to hold for an hour or longer. So if you look at Zach, he's doing quite nice here. That's a good, good integrity here at the, at the catch. And there's no visible change. And the last thing I want to touch here is the finish position. You see, we still have that very tall trunk that he's able to hold at the finish. He doesn't collapse at the finish. And a lot of people do this here. It is easy. This is easy to hold the position well. But a lot of people do this. They come to the finish and do, ugh, they collapse. And this is something you should not do. He's, he, he remains to sit tall. But that very much is a British thing. The upside to this is that almost all rowers of, of, of GB rowing have a very stable trunk. The downside is that some of them are a bit too stiff to be loose enough and flexible enough. But as we say in German, you have to die one death. So you have to learn the correct motion from one or the other way. And I'd rather go with the British way where you have first safety in terms of the body is stable and then you learn the necessary flexibility than being too flexible and never understanding how to keep the trunk engaged in a stable way. I'm not necessarily a fanboy of British rowing, but this part is, is just, a, it, it's very well thought out. And you see that GB rowing has done a lot of work getting many athletes through to high levels. It's, it's simply a very effective way to teach people how to row. You guys ready for stage number two? Let's look at the same kind of rowing at a higher stroke rate. And I try to look at it from a advanced to professional standpoint of view. So now we're talking about highly competitive masses rowers. Um, if you don't know how quick they are, they're insanely quick. I'm talking about juniors under 23 is elite level athletes wanting to go for the top of the world and talking about Olympic athletes. This is where we are at right now in terms of level. Check it out. So let's, there's another video of SAC out there and it's a uh, UT1. That's a bit of a higher intensity, mid twenties stroke rate. And you probably will not be able to hold this longer than 45 minutes on average. So here you see one of the problems that we'll show later in the last video that I'm going to show you then, and it's the shoulders. Exactly weak point number two, namely here. Here at that stage, the shoulders, and that's what I was referring to before, are actually going up. The moment his legs start to apply force, here the legs can hold it, the trunk can somewhat hold it, but you see, there's a slight bit of bend here as well. So what works in low stroke rates where you can compensate does not necessarily always transfer up one, one to one into higher stroke rates when you become tired and the load becomes more. Why? I think Zach is kicking a bit too hard with his legs. You can see this is not a smooth entry. And the idea is that you put your blades in the water in such a way that they, they don't go any deeper than that. So the, the top edge of the blade should be vertically absolutely stabilized. And it's not. It's not absolutely stabilized. The blades will go a bit deeper. If the blades go deeper, his hands will go up. The question is why? Because the shoulders are overwhelmed by the hard leg drive. And the leg drive that starts before the blades are fully connected in the water. From a professional standpoint of view, the connection phase at the catch is a very delicate topic. You have to make sure that your blades are vertically dead stable and you have to make sure that you find horizontal connections so in this way on both sides and it's not going to happen at the same time usually. I mean these conditions are probably picture perfect but even there you could have a vortex underneath the water surface that you don't see. So more often than not on, on um, port and starboard so right and left you will have a slightly different point of time when you find horizontal grip on the water. The problem is if you start to work with your legs before you found that connection, so there's before you feel the connection, so there's not enough sensing going on, then you will accelerate the blade and the blade will smack the water a tiny bit. So this is all the splash that you see here. And of course I'm complaining on a high level, but hey, this guy went for the Olympics one of the best athletes in the world. And this is 
if you smack the water, you send energy this way, right onto the blades, and then of course energy comes back. Because the moment the blade finds resistance, boom, then the energy travels back into the body. And this is usually when weak point number two, right here, is overwhelmed. Because your shoulders are not so strong. They might be able to transfer something once you've found connection and there's not that much torque. But the moment you hit the water too hard with your legs, it will always overpower any other body part. Then the force that will travel back from the blades into the shoulders, then you end up with the weakest link. And the weakest link is either here, in his case, this is not given, or here, point number two. So we have a congestion of energy. And that congestion of energy will always result in the weakest link giving in, and the weakest link are the shoulders. So if I delete all my drawing here and watch him roll, you can now see his shoulders visibly working. At the beginning, he's trying to lengthen it out just to compensate that. But when we now look at his trials here, you can see the shoulders go up quite a bit. Look at, look at the shoulders right here. The shoulders will go up just in a moment. Here, they lengthen out and they're too high. Now, what is the problem if the shoulders go up? And you can try this with me. One of the most important muscles we have to transfer force from the shoulders down into the trunk is the latissimus dorsi. Now, how do we engage that? Now, try it out with me. Keep your shoulders very low, please. Now, try to spread your wings. Try to make here everything around your armpit as wide as possible. Okay, good. And now, elevate your shoulders. You feel how narrow the same body part right there just became? Okay, now lower your shoulders again. You feel, ah, it's becoming pretty wide. So, the moment your shoulders go up at that stage, this is exactly the moment when your latissimus dorsi will disengage partially. And this is when you have a lot of force transfer over the erectors, so the linear muscles. We're not going through the armpits into the back, which would be the more logical chain for the body. We're going over the top. So the traps and erectors, and that's going to round your back. In a UT2 environment, so in the low steady state for my athletes, that's roughly at O. You can compensate, that's okay. But their talk about stroke rate 24, 25, 30, 30 plus, this is when these muscles will become tired. And I think this is the reason why, why Sack lost energy and lost speed, because he had these small muscles trying to compensate because he, he used smaller muscles than he could have used. Had he had more, more control and where he had he been able to control the blades a bit better, so the blade work a bit better, as great as it looks, I think he would have been able to hold his shoulder better because the, inten the intentions were there. There was just a link missing. Then he would have been able to use his body weight much better. But he's I think he's not using his body weight as effectively as he could have used it. Again, I'm complaining on a very high level. We are looking at one of the best rowers in the world. And the coach tried to film the bow here and, and said, okay, look you know, how nicely the bow is, is, is gliding through the water without stopping. But it is stopping. It is stopping. And that's precisely when he smacks, when he smacks the water with his blades. There's one final idea, and I might do a follow-up video on that if you guys are interested, because I found one more point which I'm not going to elaborate on right now. It looks like he's sliding forward. It doesn't look like at that stage that he's actually trying to control the boat with his, with his hip flexors. At that stage here, you do a body weight shift and you try to attract the boat to bring it closer. And he's consistently leaning forward a bit more and more and more and more and more as he is reaching the catch. And therefore he loads up his hands a bit more and more and more and more. And he has to compensate. Let me explain in simple ways. If you slide forward and at the same time you lean forward, you will find yourself falling over forward a bit. So you rest and your oar handles too much. This will make your blades go up quite a bit. How do you compensate if you want to have your blades approach the water? Well, you either have to shoot the slides or you have to go up. Or, this is what Zach does or did, 
you have to lengthen out the shoulders. And that's what he did. The lengthening out of the shoulders is actually excellent, but not if the shoulders go up. But in his case, they had to do something because he loaded his hands just before the catch by continuously leaning forward as he approached the catch. Here. Continuously leaning forward. That. At that stage, you've got an angle here. We've got the, let's call it angle alpha. At that stage, you want to close that angle from your legs. You do not want to close that angle from your trunk going forward, okay? This is not what you want to do. You want to track the boat. And I think that was one of the points and probably a result of, of spending too much time on the erg because this is where you learn to slide forward and backward. But the dynamic ergs, it's better, but it's not optimum. Um, I think you need a true rowing environment to learn this better because it's not just going forward, it's also going out. This, that triggers different muscle groups. Let, let's leave it here. There's more to be said about this. If this video was interesting for you, give it a thumbs up and subscribe. That helps me a lot. The more subscribers I've got, the more time I can and will spend with videos just like this one where everybody benefits and profits. If you want to join the discussion, go to rowing.zone. That's the social network that I'm trying to create for rowing. It's very small, it's slowly starting, and in order to make it more attractive and interesting, I've created a free classified ads page where everybody can place classified ads at no cost. With this being said, if you want to work with me, my website is armtraining.com. And the best way to start to work with me is to simply send me an email, info at armtraining.com. And then I call you and we'll try to find out how we can work together, how it can help you reach your goal. If you haven't checked out the bio rower yet, and it was featured a couple times in this video, that's where I learned a good deal of what I know about force curves and rowing technique. Shape, that shaped a lot of my understanding and it shapes a lot of technical understanding and also health feedbacks of my customers and athletes. So it's byrow.com. This is where you'll learn more about this very special rowing simulator. I'm looking forward to meet you at Head of the Charles 2023. And if you watch this video at the later stage, go to byrow.com and armtraining.com. This is where we always distribute news where we're going to be next. Have a very good day. I hope you're all doing fine. And I'm looking forward to see you in the next video. Until then, all the best. Bye bye. Check it out.